more than 4 billion people live across Asia. And we are telling their stories. In this edition, how hawkers in Singapore are keeping their trade alive. and New Zealand's fight to protect their endangered birds. It's hot, noisy and chaotic. But for many, this is a culinary haven. Welcome to Singapore's Hawker Centre, a foodie's paradise steeped in tradition, culture and history. <laughs> With so many stalls to choose from, some might feel daunted. But when in doubt, follow the crowds. I did exactly that and found myself at Chu Ki Noodles, which doesn't just have long lines, but a long history too. Spanning three generations, it is one of Singapore's oldest noodle vendors. At its helm, 86-year-old Madam Lan Yut Yao, who migrated from Guangzhou, China, when she was just 17. Lam was one of the many Chinese coolies, or unskilled immigrants, who left the shores of China in search of a better life. The year was 1965, and with the pressure of having to raise five children, she decided to set up a push cart on Old Airport Road. The妈妈就想既然我们是广东人我们就卖回我们广东人的东西吧这样他就卖了云吞面广东人呢卖云吞面那个福建人呢就卖那个泡米虾面然后那个潮州人就卖鱼丸面所以我们的东西都是我卖
也就面是怎么做的？因为我还没做过面呢，我只会卖面，不会做面。去买书来看，慢慢从从错误里面慢慢研究，呃，慢慢研究。呃，半年后我们就开始呃有我们自己的面了。At that time, hawkers producing their own brand of noodles were rare, but the business decision paid off. Profits jumped 15%. After they started selling their own brand of vegetable-based noodles, but for them, their biggest source of pride has been to see their children finish their education. Their daughter Ai Ming was in a comfortable banking job, but love for her parents and the legacy of her family constantly tugged at her. This wonton noodle, choki, means a lot to me. It comes down to my parents. Since young, I see them working so hard for us, our education, our daily needs. They are always very um, passionate. They're always very uh, motivated. They, they, it's like they will never sleep in just because they feel a lot more tired that day. Despite the hardships that come with running a hawker stall, Ai Ming and her brother decided to join the family business. During uni days, I already. I felt like I want to graduate and then go to Choki. But for my mother, she, she thought that I should go and work, work outside. From Singapore's central business district to running a kitchen, Ai Ming had to make quite a few adjustments. It's a lot different, very, very different. When you go to a hawker centre, you cannot spend too much time on your makeup and, and your outfit. The hours are a lot, a lot longer, a lot, a lot tougher. Since young, so I've been watching my parents do it, uh, and also uh, been helping out during school holidays. More or less, I'm mentally prepared. Sometimes we cook non-stop for three to four hours. Don't even have the time to go to the toilet. <laughs> I want to step in, step up to help them retire uh, gracefully, like not when they are sick. When he said to me to go to work, of course, I and my wife are very happy because at least my job will not be the last one in our hands. Over the years, local food and hawker culture have become distinctive features of local food and hawker culture have become distinctive features of Singapore's identity. It's no wonder that the island state wants its street food to be recognized as an intangible UNESCO cultural heritage. I definitely think that the uh, hawker food is part of Singapore's local identity because that's uh, what I would think that binds Singaporeans of all walks of life. I love my job because this is my mother's life. I think it's important that you love your things, you love your work. I love this job. Ai Ming It's very hard to imagine my family without Choki because we really grew up with it. I'm really proud that my parents actually have run a, a wonton noodle store that I could say that is top 10 in Singapore. Like I go to school, I tell people my parents uh, sell wonton noodle at Old Airport Road, they always know which one. But with rising rental prices and competition from hipster cafes and air-conditioned food stalls, will the humble noodle store be able to keep up we don't have young customers. We have a lot of like 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. I feel like we need to be outstanding. We need to stand out our product uh, to attract uh, new, new customers, especially. Uh, we're always constantly thinking of new ideas or improvements, like uh, social media, to engage more young customers and then to also use a different brand, branding, marketing style for Choki. We introduced a logo so that when Choki uh, move forward or uh, we open outlets, people can like relate us to the, the same, like the same store. Despite the passion and determination, the future for a family business like Choki remains uncertain. I hope that our hawker store still exists that our hawker centre would, would be as vibrant as today, or even better. While Ai Ming is uncertain about the future of Singapore's hawker culture, others remain hopeful. Before, 
并不是很友善的，因为他们已经有一种分别之分。我们是比较做低下一点的工作。他，所以我们现在做到这个年代，很多小贩都有读书的。都孩子，就是我孩子接手都有读书的，所以这种现象现在在改变。Perhaps the biggest indication that hawker culture will continue to thrive is this: for the first time, Michelin stars were awarded to hawkers. Chan Hongming is one of 12 hawkers to receive a Michelin star for his famous Hong Kong soya sauce chicken rice and noodles. 自从得到米其林之后，我知道这个小小的摊位根本已经做不出成绩来，因为太多人潮。那时候已经等一盘鸡饭需要两三个小时。以前是两块钱一盘鸡饭，像现在是两块八毛。全部应该我们端一只鸡来算呢，是四百多只鸡。And although Hawker Chan has opened restaurants in Singapore and has expanded to 24 stores in seven countries and regions, like Choki Noodles, he also had a rather humble beginning. 很年轻的时候跟海鲜楼做厨房的打杂，后来在哦啊一个缘之下认识了一个师伯，就是香港的，他们把香港的油鸡带过来烧腊什么这里做做做。可是那时候我觉得啊、呃、很奇怪的一件事是，我看过的只有白鸡还有烧鸡，很少见这种油鸡酱做法。我是的，那时候觉得。啊，不错。可是我觉得他还有改变的一个程度。What sets him apart, he says, is his secret recipe sauce. 酱料我们还是我们中央厨房自己生产出来，其实没有人知道，只有发啊工厂的人把它每一批都不同的人做，你根本就是一没有办法知道了嘛。In 2016, seven years after running his store. Chen received a letter that would change his fate. It was an invite to be part of Singapore's first Michelin guide. 所以第一次我得到的时候，其实我很惊讶，而且有点怀疑，到底是请我们去参观而已啊，还是在这个晚会上啊、呃、大家交流？可是我不知道米其林这个威力这么大。<laughs> Despite the fame and fortune. Hawker Chan still sells his food at an affordable price. 不管你是多少颗星，我们做的要做大众化的啊，不管他有钱没钱都可以吃得起的，所以这种行业是最好做的。He now hopes to bring his dish to other parts of the world. 最开心的就是把这一道小贩的这一道普通的很多人吃的菜，把它发扬每一个国家。我希望它成为。一个好像由小到老都认识的，就是肯德基这样，成为每个人的口头禅，说啊，好客餐就是做卖油鸡的，要全世界都知道。But one of the hawker chan's dreams might be a little more difficult to achieve, that of a multi-generational business. 暂时我不知道怎样传下去，因为我可能我的只有一个女儿，很难传。如果他喜欢做这行，而且我会尽量的鼓励他，我不会教他我现在的经营方式，我要他自己想出一套，那到他的年代的时候怎样经营这种啊食谱。我如果我给他的话，我相信他要用以后的那代啊方程式来做，还会成功。For Chan. The legacy of age-old family businesses is an achievement in itself. Actually, One has found international fame. While the other managed to inspire the next generation to keep cooking, when it comes to Singapore's hawker culture, 
Both Hawker Chan and Madame Lam are living examples of how much can come out of a humble hawker stall and how far you can go with just one dish. For Assignment Asia, I'm Miro Lu in Singapore. Up next, the predators that New Zealand needs to wipe out in order to save their birds from extinction. New Zealand is blessed with more forests than most countries. A quarter of the nation is still covered with native trees, including the majestic Rimu. On the forest floor, an inquisitive robin hunts for insects, but there's an eerie silence. It's because there's hardly any bird song, and the reason is that every year, an estimated 25 million native birds are killed by invasive predators like the stoat. The truth is there are many, many of our species, particularly our birds and uh, our invertebrates, that um, are on the brink of extinction. Giant birds like the Haast's eagle and the mower roamed free before the arrival of humans and predators. They now count among 50 species gone forever. Miraculously, the flightless takahe has survived, but the loss of diversity is ongoing and 80% of the country's remaining native birds are still threatened with extinction. Highly respected environmentalist Sir Rob Fenwick was also facing extinction from cancer when we met to discuss his personal war against predators. I don't know how many rats I've destroyed or how many stoats we've killed, a lot. Uh, uh, you know, um, you'd be astonished how many... Hundreds? Uh, no, thousands. Thousands of rats. Sir Rob's belief that introduced pests could be completely eradicated led to the formation of a government-supported predator-free 2050 program. This really is New Zealand's last shot at saving our precious nature. Uh, it's hanging by a thread, you know, and um, the survival of our native birds and insects is far from guaranteed. It's going to be 28 degrees today, just came through on national radio. So um, just um, sunscreen, you've got those squinches, lots of water. Across the country, community groups are being mobilised. This one on Waiheke Island as part of a $100 million campaign to eradicate invasive pests like the stoat. This is what a stoat looks like, so obviously um, one of the worst killers of New Zealand species. Um, it's a real killing machine, um, comes from England, was brought in to control rabbits. But stoats would rather eat birds, like the dotterel. Once common throughout the country, predators have reduced their entire population to less than 2,000. This is the first time I've ever been so close to the New Zealand dotterel. And Paul, tell me about its status in New Zealand. How endangered is it? Uh, it is, it's critically endangered. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a native uh, ground nesting bird. Um, primarily at the moment, it, it tends to uh, nest uh, on shorelines. Um, and with the introduction of animals uh, and mammals, such as um, the stoat, um, it's, it's really decimated the populations throughout the country. Stoats are found everywhere, and they're lethal. They can climb, swim, and run quickly over long distances to kill prey. They're also wary of humans, which is why traps offer a free meal of rabbit meat before they're set to kill. And the idea behind that is that it gets uh, stoats, in this case, um, excited about um, the traps and they relate this trap to f a food um, source. So you're effectively playing mind games with the stoats? <laughs> effectively, we're trying to. They are sneaky, smart critters 
um, and we hope that um, we can actually knock them on the head um, using this uh, method. On Waiheke Island, it's expected to take two years to eliminate just 600 stoats using a grid of 1,500 traps, all monitored in real time. And we can track everything from um, field worker locations, um, hazard management, um, incident reporting, so all the health and safety aspects of, of the job. An estimated 30 million possums and rats are also on the predator hit list. However, the government's use of highly poisonous 1080 bait dropped from helicopters is controversial. 1080 also kills native birds, but Sir Rob defends its use. 1080 is the most effective weapon we have and if we weren't using it and if we hadn't used it over the last decade or so um, we would have lost spe you know, whole species, there's no doubt about that. Project Director Mary Frankham also believes the potential environmental benefits are huge. We are surrounded by this archipelago of islands, 17 of which are already predator free. We're on the Seabird Superhighway. There's a huge opportunity for Waiheke to really support those populations of uh, New Zealand wildlife and then export them to the mainland, yeah. The big question is, what would New Zealand look like if there were no predators? Well, one local community has decided to find out by building a fence to keep pests out of their local forest. But this is no ordinary fence because it stretches an amazing 47 kilometres around the base of a mountain. It's the world's largest pest-proof fence and took four years to construct. It's designed to last 30 years, but ranger Dan Cowie says that predators are a constant threat. The fence itself is monitored 24-7, so there's a surveillance wire on the top. Uh, so if a tree falls through the fence, we have a team uh, that will respond to that within 90 minutes. Within that 90 minutes, we will have an invasive mammal testing that fence. And inside the 3,400 hectare sanctuary, vegetation previously destroyed by wild animals is now flourishing. The forest is resilient. There is a great seed bank within the soil and the environment that the forest creates uh, allows for these seedlings to develop. Yeah. Yeah. If we remove those pests, if we take the pressure off these plant species, then the forest redevelops and as a consequence the bird species and the like return. One of those species is the kaka, a bush parrot that eats native fruits and distributes precious seeds throughout the forest. The North Island robin is another vulnerable species that's now thriving on the protected mountain, known to locals as Maunga Tautri. That's one of the main goals of Maunga Tautri, is to be a source population, uh, to uh, be re reintroduce these birds to, to other parts of the country. Sanctuary Mountain is also home to a family of five of the world's rarest and most endangered birds, the takahe that there's about 418 in the whole world and they're all found here in New Zealand. And uh, what we're doing here is looking after the family to help those numbers to grow. How do you feel about working with such an endangered species? How special is that? Pretty privileged. So we're sitting in front of, you know, around 1% of the total world's population of Takahe. Um, the longer you spend with them, the more time you watch them, the more delightful things you learn about them and their personalities, why they're so special. The Takahe would not survive outside their wetland enclosure, and nor would the Tuatara, one of the world's oldest reptile species known as the living dinosaur. So females will breed, lay eggs, maybe every four to six years or so, about 10 to 12 eggs in a clutch, and if a rat was to find that clutch in the soil, dig it up and eat them, then they haven't been able to replace themselves, um, and it takes a long time to do so, and that's why rats are a big problem for tuatara. Another vulnerable species is New Zealand's national symbol, the kiwi. The flightless birds can live for up to 50 years, 
but 9 out of 10 chicks born in the wild are killed by predators, which is why Sanctuary Mountain is a safe haven for breeding. We have 62 males on transmitter in the wild now. Um, if they all play their part, we'll be inundated with kiwi next year. Yeah. The young birds come from a nearby hatchery, and before every release, they receive a traditional Māori blessing for a safe journey into the forest. After passing through security gates into the safety of the enclosure, it's then a short hike to the edge of the forest, where a suitable burrow is found amongst fallen leaves and branches. And then, the precious moment of release, into a breeding program that aims to produce 500 birds within three years. When I'm an old man sitting in a rest home, you know, I'll be able to watch Kiwis leaving the sanctuary to form other populations and to know that I was a core part of what happened here um, is, is pretty cool. Would the rest of the groups like to go and get their trapping boxes and bring them back to the pathway? Okay, off you go to your stations. Predator-free 2050 isn't just being left to the experts. Young eco-warriors are eager to join the cause, including this group at Summerland Primary in West Auckland, who are baiting traps with peanut butter to attract rats. Don't put your finger in, we don't want to catch a human. These pest detectives are being taught to identify predators by their footprints and their bite marks, and they're learning why insects are an important part of the food chain. But getting up close and personal is much more fun. Oh my god, look at that! Oh, oh, yes. oh yes. whatever it's called. <laughs> That's That's cool. Cool. I thought that was a leaf before. Whoa! Oh, that was cool. That's love. called a leaf hopper. There's also a serious side, like planting native shrubs to encourage more birds and insects. I think the biggest achievement is to see the children's enthusiasm and passion for their environment. And they can see the um, the growth and the progress in their native forest. They can see from the number of rats and mice they've been catching that they can make a difference. If we kill the rats, then we can um, save the insects and the birds and everything. The choice of 2050 as the target date for complete eradication highlights the costly and time-consuming challenge of eliminating tens of millions of predators from New Zealand's often rugged and remote landscape. But since the official launch in 2016, a quarter of New Zealand's 600 islands have been declared pest-free. We can visit um, you know, quite big uh, islands where uh, around the coast of New Zealand where predators have been eradicated. And the bird life is spectacular. It's beautiful and it's noisy and it reminds you of what New Zealand was like before human inhabitation. Sadly, this was to be Sir Rob's final television interview. He succumbed to cancer in March 2020 but his vision for a predator-free future was clear. My dream is that you know, our native forests and our shorelines, the places where special biodiversity is on display, become internationally uh, important places to celebrate the diversity of New Zealand's nature. Follow us on social media to contribute story ideas and share your thoughts.